All right, so I'd like to introduce uh, our next speaker, Sandeep uh, Jawahar, uh, is the author of Intern at Heart. Uh, it's a, a history in uh, one of the best selling uh, uh, book. Is Sandeep around? Okay. Sandeep, come on up here. We're looking forward to this. I think all of us in the field of cardiology have seen, and we, we it's actually been very interesting with the uh, recognition of Takasubu is the important aspect uh, of uh, which had previously been written off about someone having a severe emotional issue and, quote, having a heart attack, but it's been something which is has been an area of interest for a long time, but the science is catching up, I think, in terms of some of the parts that we've seen in the past. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Valentine, uh, for the introduction. And uh, I want to thank the organizers and uh, the other CMHC uh, chairs for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a real honor for me. I very much respect the work that this Congress uh, is doing and has been doing. Uh, this conference reminds us of the importance of cardiometabolic risk factors, such as diabetes, dyslipidemia, and so on, in the development of heart disease. Most of you know that these risk factors were elucidated by the Framingham Heart Study that was begun in the late 1940s. That study has produced immeasurable benefits. Today we know that programs that target cardiometabolic risk factors improve public health. For example, a 12-year study of 20,000 Swedish men showed that almost four out of five heart attacks could be prevented through Framingham-inspired lifestyle changes. However, it's important to remember that when Framingham was started, its focus was not on cardiometabolic risk. At the study's outset, factors that were hypothesized to increase heart disease were very different and included, quote, nervous and mental states, occupation, economic status, and the use of stimulants like benzedrine. But the character of the study changed in the early 1950s. The focus shifted toward investigating biological rather than, quote, psychosocial risk factors. Questions about sexual dysfunction, psychiatric problems, emotional stress, income, and social class were discarded. As one researcher put it, the Framingham study, as it emerged in the 1950s, had, quote, little interest in investigating psychosomatic, constitutional, or sociological determinants of heart disease. My talk today will focus on precisely those factors. In other words, on what one might call the emotional aspects of the human heart. This subject would, come, would have come as no surprise to our ancient philosophers. Over the course of history, the heart has always been a symbol of our emotional lives. It was considered by many to be the seat of the soul, the repository of the emotions. The very word emotion derives from the French verb émouvoir, meaning to stir up. And perhaps it is only logical that emotions would be linked to an organ characterized by its agitated movement. The symbolism of the emotional heart endures even today. If we ask people which image they most associate with love, there is no doubt that the Valentine heart would top the list. The heart shape, called a cardioid, is common in nature. It appears in the leaves, flowers, and seeds of many plants, including sylphium, which was used for birth control in the early Middle Ages and maybe the reason why the heart became associated with sex and romantic love. Whatever the reason, hearts began to appear in paintings of lovers in the 13th century. 
Over time, the pictures came to be colored red, the color of blood, a symbol of passion. Later, heart-shaped ivy, reputed for its longevity and grown on tombstones, became an emblem of eternal love. In the Roman Catholic Church, the heart shape became known as the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Adorned with thorns and emitting ethereal light, it was an insignia of monastic love. This association between the heart and love has withstood modernity. When Barney Clark, a retired dentist with end-stage heart failure, received the first permanent artificial heart in Utah on December 1st, 1982, his wife of 39 years asked the doctors, quote, will he still be able to love me? Today we know that the heart is not the source of love or the other emotions per se. The ancients were mistaken. And yet more and more we've come to understand that the connection between the heart and the emotions is a highly intimate one. The heart does not originate our feelings, but it is highly responsive to them. In a sense, a record of our emotional life is written on our hearts. Fear and grief, for example, can cause profound cardiac injury. The nerves that control unconscious processes, such as the heartbeat, can sense distress and trigger a maladaptive fight or flight response that signals blood vessels to constrict, the heart to gallop, and blood pressure to rise, resulting in damage. In other words, it is increasingly clear that our hearts are extraordinarily sensitive to our emotional system, to the metaphorical heart, if you will. Let me start by discussing what is perhaps the archetype of the heart-head connection, Takasubo cardiomyopathy, or the broken heart syndrome. As you are all aware, in Takasubo cardiomyopathy, the heart acutely weakens in response to extreme stress or grief, such as after a romantic breakup or the death of a spouse. Patients, almost always women for unclear reasons, develop symptoms that mimic those of a heart attack. They may develop chest pain and shortness of breath, even congestive heart failure. On an echocardiogram, the heart muscle appears stunned, frequently ballooning into the distinctive shape of a takasubo, a Japanese pot with a wide base and a narrow neck. Though we don't know exactly why this happens, the syndrome often resolves within a few weeks. However, in the acute period, it can cause heart failure, life-threatening arrhythmias, even death. This syndrome may occur even when patients are not conscious of their grief. The husband of an elderly patient of mine had died two weeks prior. She was sad, of course, but accepting, maybe even a bit relieved. It had been a long illness. He'd had dementia. But a week after the funeral, she looked at his picture and became tearful. And then she got chest pain, and with it came shortness of breath, distended neck veins, a sweaty brow, a noticeable panting while she was sitting quietly in a chair, all signs of congestive heart failure. On an ultrasound, the heart had weakened to less than half its normal function. But nothing on other tests was amiss. No sign of clogged arteries anywhere. Two weeks later, her emotional state had returned to normal, and so, an ultrasound confirmed, had her heart. Takasubo cardiomyopathy has been reported in many stressful situations, including public speaking, gambling losses, domestic disputes, even a surprise birthday party. Outbreaks of it have even been associated with widespread social upheaval, such as after a natural disaster. For example, in 2004, a major earthquake devastated a district on the largest island in Japan. 39 people were killed and more than 3,000 were injured. On the heels of this catastrophe, Researchers found that there was a 24-fold increase in the number of Takotsubo cases in the district one month after the earthquake, compared with a similar period the year before. The residences of these cases were closely correlated with the intensity of the tremor. 
In almost every case, patients lived near the epicenter. The broken heart syndrome has even been studied in the United States. Scientists at the University of Arkansas identified almost 22,000 patients diagnosed with Takotsubo cardiomyopathy in the United States in 2011. The highest rate of cases, nearly triple the national average, was in Vermont, where a tropical storm wreaked more damage that year than in nearly a century. The second highest rate was in Missouri, where a massive tornado ripped through the town of Joplin, killing at least 158 people. Though these geographic areas were not the only ones hit by natural disasters that year, the scientists noted that their populations were perhaps less prepared because of a lack of experience with natural disasters and thus more vulnerable to the ensuing distress. Interestingly, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy can develop after a happy event, too. But the heart appears to react differently, ballooning in the mid-portion, for instance, rather than at the apex. Why different emotional precipitants result in different cardiac changes is a mystery. But today, perhaps as an ode to our ancient philosophers, we can acknowledge that even if our emotions are not located inside our hearts, the biological heart overlaps its metaphorical counterpart in surprising and mysterious ways. Heart syndromes, including sudden death, have long been reported in individuals experiencing intense emotional disturbance or turmoil in their metaphorical hearts. In 1942, the Harvard physiologist Walter Cannon published a paper called Voodoo Death, in which he described cases of death from fright in people who believed they had been cursed, such as by a witch doctor or as a consequence of eating taboo fruit. Sometimes the victim, all hope lost, dropped dead on the spot. What these deaths had in common was the victim's absolute belief that there was an external force that could cause their demise and against which they were powerless to fight. This perceived lack of control, Cannon postulated, resulted in an unmitigated physiological response in which blood vessels constricted to such a degree that blood volume acutely dropped, blood pressure plummeted, the heart acutely weakened, and massive organ damage resulted from a lack of transported oxygen. Cannon believed that voodoo deaths were limited to primitive people, quote, so superstitious, so ignorant, that they feel themselves bewildered strangers in a hostile world. But over the years, these types of deaths have been shown to affect all manner of modern people too. Today, death by grief has been observed in spouses and siblings. Broken hearts are literally and figuratively deadly. These associations hold true even for animals we wouldn't consider vulnerable to emotional disruption. For example, in a study in the journal Science, researchers fed caged rabbits a high cholesterol diet to study its effect on heart disease. Surprisingly, they found that animals in high cages got much more cardiovascular disease than ones in cages near the floor. The scientists investigated air circulation and other possible factors without success. Then they discovered that the technician who delivered food played more often with the animals in the lower cages than with the ones near the ceiling. So they repeated the study, randomly dividing the rabbits, all of them fed a high cholesterol diet, into two groups. One group that was removed from their cages and petted, talked to, held, and played with, and another that remained in their cages and was ignored. The first group had 60% less aortic disease on autopsy than the second, despite having comparable cholesterol levels, heart rate, and blood pressure. Consider another example, Japanese immigrants. Coronary artery disease is relatively rare in Japan. However, its rate is almost double 
in Japanese immigrants who settle in Hawaii and triple in those who settle in the mainland United States. Parts of the explanation might be that Japanese immigrants adopt unhealthy American habits, like a sedentary lifestyle or a diet rich in processed foods. Still, Framingham cardiometabolic risk factors do not fully explain the disparity. In the early 1970s, Sir Michael Marmot and his colleagues at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health studied nearly 4,000 middle-aged Japanese men living in the San Francisco Bay Area. They found that immigrants who stayed true to their Japanese roots, as evidenced in surveys by their ability to read Japanese, the frequency with which they spoke Japanese, the frequency with which they had Japanese coworkers, and so on. That group had a much lower prevalence of heart disease, even when they matched Americans in terms of serum cholesterol and blood pressure, than immigrants who were more integrated into their new culture. Traditional Japanese immigrants had coronary disease rates in line with their homeland counterparts. Westernized immigrants had a prevalence that was at least three times higher. The authors concluded that, quote, retention of Japanese group relationships is associated with a lower rate of coronary heart disease. And so, acculturation, they declared, is a major risk factor for coronary disease in immigrant populations. Now, if cutting traditional cultural ties increases the risk of heart disease, then psychosocial factors must play a role in cardiovascular health. Today, we know this to be true in many strata of human society. For example, American blacks in poor urban centers have a much higher prevalence of hypertension and cardiovascular disease than other groups. Some have proposed genetics to be the deciding factor. However, this is an unlikely explanation because American blacks have hypertension at much higher rates than their West African counterparts. Moreover, hypertension pervades other segments of American society in which poverty and social ills are rampant. Peter Sterling, the University of Pennsylvania neurobiologist, has written that hypertension in such communities is a normal response to what he calls chronic arousal or stress. In small pre-industrial communities, he writes, people tend to know and trust one another. Generosity is rewarded. Cheating tends to be punished. When this milieu is disrupted, as in migration or urbanization, there is often an increased need for vigilance. People get estranged from their neighbors. Communities become diverse and more mistrustful. Physical and social isolation often results. Add in poverty, fragmented families, and joblessness, and you get extremely stress-prone populations. The chronic arousal triggers release of hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol that tighten blood vessels and cause retention of salt. These in turn lead to long-term changes like arterial wall thickening and stiffening that increase blood pressure that the body tries to then maintain. In Sterling's formulation, nothing is broken, except perhaps the system. The body is responding exactly in the way it should to the chronic fight or flight circumstances in which it finds itself. If Takotsubo cardiomyopathy proves that acute psychological disruption can damage the heart, Sterling's theories suggest that chronic low-level stress may be just as harmful. His theories put psychosocial factors front and center in how we think about and approach heart problems. They show that chronic heart disease, unloosed from a Framingham cage, is inextricably linked to the state of our neighborhoods, jobs, and families. Heart disease in this conception is no longer strictly biological. It is cultural and political as well. 
improving our social structures and relationships becomes not only a quality of life issue, but also a public health concern. The harmful cardiovascular effects of chronic arousal apply to, to, to traditionally white communities too. One example is the Whitehall study, also conducted by Marmot, of 17,000 male workers in the British civil service. In this study, early death and poor health were found to increase stepwise from the highest to the lowest levels of the civil service hierarchy. Messengers and porters had nearly twice the death rate of higher ranking administrators. Even after accounting for differences in smoking, plasma cholesterol, blood pressure, and alcohol consumption. None of these civil servants were poor in the usual sense. They all enjoyed clean water, plenty of food, and proper toilet facilities. The main ways they differed were in occupational prestige, job control, and other gradients of the social hierarchy. Marmot and his co-workers concluded that emotional disturbance because of financial instability, time pressures, lack of advancement, and a general dearth of autonomy drives much of the difference in survival. He writes, quote, both low-grade civil servant and slum dweller lack control over their lives. They do not have the opportunity to lead lives they have reason to value. In my book, Heart a History, I describe how the care of the heart has become less the province of philosophers who dwelled on the heart's metaphorical meanings and more the concern of doctors wielding technologies that even a century ago, because of the heart's exalted status in human culture, were considered taboo. The great pioneers include Daniel Hale Williams, the African-American doctor who performed the world's first documented open heart surgery in Gilded Age Chicago, and C. Walton Lillehei, who connected a child's circulatory system to a healthy parent's, paving the way for the heart-lung machine. A common theme connecting such discoveries is the transformation of the human heart from an almost supernatural object imbued with metaphor and meaning into a machine that can be manipulated and controlled. But these manipulations we now understand must be complemented by attention to the emotional life that the heart for thousands of years was believed to contain. Consider, for example, the Lifestyle Heart Trial published in the British journal The Lancet in 1990. 48 patients with moderate or severe coronary artery disease were randomly assigned to usual care or an intensive lifestyle that included a low-fat vegetarian diet, an hour of daily walking, group psychosocial support, and stress management. After a year, the lifestyle patients had nearly a 5% reduction in coronary plaque. Control patients, on the other hand, had an average 5% more coronary obstruction after one year and 28% after five years. They also had roughly double the rate of cardiac events, including heart attacks, coronary bypass surgery, and cardiac-related deaths. Now, here's an interesting fact. Some patients in the control group, the authors said, adopted diet and exercise plans that were almost as intense as those of the intervention group. However, their heart disease still progressed. Diet and exercise alone were not enough to facilitate coronary disease regression. At both one and five year follow-ups, stress management was more strongly correlated with reversal of coronary artery disease than exercise. The lead author of the study said this, quote, the need for connection and community often goes unfulfilled in our culture. 
We know that these things affect the quality of our lives, but they also affect our survival to a much larger degree than most people realize. Many studies have suggested that he is right. For example, patients who are depressed after a heart attack are several times as likely to die within six months as those who are not, irrespective of usual cardiac risk factors like high cholesterol, hypertension, obesity, and smoking. Menopausal women with no history of cardiovascular disease who expressed more hopelessness on a psychological questionnaire had more carotid artery thickening and an older vascular age than matched patients who felt good about their lives. Now, no doubt, many of these studies are small or observational, and of course, correlation does not prove causation. It is certainly possible that stress leads to unhealthy habits, and this is the real reason for the increased cardiovascular risk. But as with the association of smoking with lung cancer, when so many studies show the same thing, and there are mechanisms to explain a causal relationship, it seems capricious to deny that one probably exists. What many doctors have concluded is fully consistent with what I too have learned in my nearly two decades as a heart failure specialist. The emotional heart affects its biological counterpart in surprising and mysterious ways. And yet medicine today continues to conceptualize the heart as a machine. That conceptualization has had great benefits. Cardiology has undoubtedly been one of the greatest scientific success stories of the past 100 years. Heart transplants, pacemakers, coronary bypass surgery, implantable defibrillators, coronary angioplasty, all of these things were discovered or invented after World War II. However, it's possible we've approached the limits of what scientific medicine can do to combat heart disease. Indeed, the rate of decline in cardiovascular mortality has slowed significantly in the past decade. An autopsy study suggests that 80% of Americans 16 to 64 years old have at least the beginnings of coronary artery disease. These findings indicate that the four decade long decline in heart disease may be coming to a halt. We will need to shift to a new paradigm, one focused on prevention to continue to make the kind of progress to which we have become accustomed. In this paradigm, psychosocial factors will need to be front and center in how we think about health problems. Despite the centuries-old association of the heart with emotions, this is still a domain that remains largely unexplored. Last I checked, the American Heart Association still does not list emotional stress among the key modifiable risk factors for heart disease, perhaps in part because blood cholesterol is so much easier to reduce than emotional and social disruption. We need a better way, one that recognizes the power and the importance of the emotions that the heart, the metaphorical heart, was believed to house for millennia. Today, it is increasingly clear that chronic diseases like hypertension, coronary disease, and heart failure are linked to the state of our neighborhoods, jobs, families, and minds. To treat our hearts optimally will require intervention on all these fronts. This is much easier said than done, of course. Psychosocial repair is just as prone to unexpected consequences, difficult trade-offs, conflicting values, and diminishing returns as any medical treatment. But we will have to find ways, as Peter Sterling has put it, to, quote, reduce the need for vigilance, and to restore small satisfactions, such as our contact with nature and with each other. For some, this will require city planning initiatives to encourage walking or bicycling, for example, instead of more sedentary lifestyles. Others will require fortification in more social realms, 
such as the enhancement of public life. For still others, cardiovascular benefits will come from more individual pursuits, such as meditation and stress reduction. Whatever the case, it is increasingly clear that the biological heart is inextricably linked to its metaphorical counterpart. Our mindset, our coping strategies, how we navigate challenging circumstances, our capacity to, dis to transcend distress, these things I have learned are also a matter of life and death. Thank you.